Chapter 7, chapter 7. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord to the land of Israel, an end, the end is coming on the four corners of the whole land. Now the end is upon you. I shall rend my anger against you. I shall judge you according to your ways. And I shall bring all of your abominations upon yourselves. For my eye will have no pity on you, nor shall I spare you. But I shall bring your ways upon you, and the abomination will be amongst you. Then you will know that I am the Lord. For thus says the Lord, a disaster, a unique disaster. Behold, it is coming. The end is already at hand. In fact, the end has come. It has wakened, awakened against you. For behold, it is come. Your doom has come to you, O inhabitants of the land. The time has come, the day is near. Tumult rather than joyful shouting on the mountains. Now I will shortly pour out my wrath upon you and spend my anger against you, judge you according to your way, and bring upon all of you your own abominations. My eye will have and show no pity, nor will I spare. What was that? I'm trying to put my phone on vibrate for you. Oh. I thought it was a fire thing. That's what happens in my house. Bing, bing, bing. Every time Carol cooks. That's why I don't let her cook. <laughs> I can't afford new smoke detectors every time. Behold the day, behold it is coming, your doom has gone forth, and the rod has budded, arrogance has blossomed, violence has grown into the rod of now wickedness, none of you shall remain, none of the multitude, none of their wealth, none, not anything eminent amongst them. For the time has come and the day has arrived. Let not the buyer rejoice nor the seller mourn, for wrath is against everyone, the whole multitude. Indeed, the seller will not regain what he sold as long as they both live, for the vision regarding all the multitude will not be averted, nor will any of them maintain his life by his own iniquity. For they have blown the trumpet, they have made everything ready, but no one is going to battle, for my wrath is against all of them. The sword is already outside, and the plague and the famine have begun within. He who is in the field will die by sword. Famine and the plague will also consume those hidden in the city. Even when their survivors escape, they shall be upon the mountain like doves of the valley, all of them mourning each other over his own iniquity. All hands will hang limp, and all knees will become as water. And they will grind themselves and gird themselves with sackcloth, and shuddering uh, will overwhelm them. And shame shall be upon their faces, and baldness on all of their heads. They shall fling their silver into the streets, and the gold shall become an abhorrent thing. Their silver and their gold are not able to deliver them in the day of the wrath of the Lord. They cannot satisfy their appetite, nor can they fill their stomachs, for the iniquity has become a great source of stumbling. And they transform the beauty of his ornaments into pride, and there they made images of their abominations and their detestable things uh, with it. Therefore, I shall make it an abhorrent, abhorrent thing to them. And I shall give into each hands the foreigner, each one into the hands of the foreigners as plunder, and the wicked of the earth shall spoil, and they shall profane it. For I shall also turn my face from them, and they will profane my secret place, and robbers shall enter there and profane it. Make the chain, for the land is full of bloody crimes, and the city is full of nothing but violence. Therefore I shall bring the worst of the nations, and they will possess all your houses. 
and they will also make the pride of the strong ones cease, and their holy places shall be dis destroyed. When anguish comes, they will seek peace, but there will be none that is found. Disaster will come upon disaster, and rumor will be added to rumor, and they will seek a vision from their prophets, but the law will be lost uh, from the priest and the council from the elders. The king will mourn, the prince will be clothed with horror, and in the hands of the people of the land all will tremble. According to their conduct I shall deal with them, and by their judgments I shall judge them, and then they will know I am the Lord. Ooh, I think he's pissed off. Ezekiel is what we call an apocalyptic book in one sense and not in the other. Oh, no, I don't have any markers. Anyway, um, do you know where they are? Yes. Okay. Um, apocalyptic in the sense that uh, what has happened has already happened. I mean, Ezekiel is in Babylon as a prisoner now, in, as, a, as a refugee. And the Lord is saying to him, you know why this happened, don't you? And basically, Ezekiel was a 10 or 11 year old boy when they took him. So a few years later, now as a young man, that God says, you're going to be my new spokesperson. And Ezekiel's going, okay, what do you want me to do? Well, you've got to go deliver a message to what's left this generation that survived. All the small children that they brought back are now becoming adults. And he says, tell them what happened and why they're here. And um, I'm sure Ezekiel replied with, Lord, I don't actually know what happened. You know, I was snapped, grabbed up and put in chains and hauled five million miles away from my home. So I'm not sure. I keep reaching for those markers. Anyway, uh, the fact of the matter is, the event has already happened. Now, apocalyptic literature is foretelling something that hasn't happened yet. Thank you. Uh, for example, the revelation is apocalyptic. It's still apocalyptic because it hasn't happened yet. You know, the end of the world, the whole consummation of the earth thing that goes on, that has not happened yet. So the revelation of John at the end of the Bible is truly apocalyptic. This book is also, or was apocalyptic, Apocalyptic, which means it did, it, it was going to happen. God showed up with the prophets and said, you're done. Oops, got my comment in the wrong place. You're done. Then they were done. And now God has taken Ezekiel. God has taken Ezekiel here and saying, "I want you to go tell the, the people, the survivors, the remnant, as we call them, the children that were taken as slaves that are now becoming adults. I want you to go talk to them about everything that's happened." But obviously, he was one of these kids and wasn't probably quite sure what happened. They were scared to death, put in chains, dragged behind a horse for 10,000 miles to Babylon. So God is taking him back in vision and in word to show him a lot of what preceded that caused this disaster, that caused this judgment. Here it's still a judgment. And then he will show him, to complete the circle, everything that happened. And it get, the book gets a little more brutal because we are literally going back in time to re-witness what happened during that siege, during that war when the Babylonians swept around the city and destroyed everything, destroyed everybody. First, we're going to find out why it happened. Then we're going to find out how it happened. And then you're going to find out what can we do to keep this from happening again, ever. 
So that's why it's apocalyptic. You're not staying in the past tense. This whole chapter you read this morning is taking him back over here. God is making the judgment that you're done. It's coming. He doesn't necessarily say why. He just says because of your abominations. Because you made bad decisions. You know, you can't put it on me, says the Lord, because I didn't do it. You did it. God, you know, people say, well, a loving God wouldn't send his people to hell. He doesn't send people to hell. He comes so that people can be saved through him. Well, Jesus made that quite plain. But he's given us the power to decide. And in that power, in that freedom, in that license, if you will, to decide, well, we either send ourselves to hell or we get on board with the Lord and say, okay, I'll, go, I'll do it your way. You know, like I've said a million times, eternity is like the second window at McDonald's. You have the right, the power, and the decision to pull up to the first window and do what? Hey. Order anything you want. And you say, give me a Mac fish and an orange soda. And you get to the second window, what are you probably going to get? A big fish and an orange soda, right? But by somewhere in between, you decide, well, I don't want a big fish and an orange soda. I want a Big Mac and a Coca-Cola. Well, the guy says, but you ordered this. What, you going to get upset now? All he's doing is giving you what you ordered. Well, God is that guy in the second takeout window. People say, well, the loving God can't send anybody to hell. In actuality, he's not. He sticks by his own promise, his own word, which he preaches in the Old Testament. And he fulfills in the New Testament by Jesus that if anybody comes unto me, I'll take care of them. I did not come to judge the earth or destroy the world. I came to save it, for crying out loud. But if you don't want that... What's your option? God also said, everything in the earth is passing away. And you're part of that. Everything in the earth belongs to me. Everything in the earth was made just temporarily. I know the earth is 6.5 billion years old, but you know, it doesn't matter. One of these days, that will come to an end. Will it be in our lifetime? It could. Will it be in a thousand lifetimes from now? It could. You know, everybody thought back in the day of Christ the world was going to end. Even the apostles, if you're reading the Gospels, are all preaching, you better get on board now because Christ is coming back just as He said and you guys are going to be history. Well, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus walked this earth. Everybody thought the first and second world wars were the end of the world because all the nations were fighting, all the men were dying, all, everything was going crazy. And it was. First World Wars back in 1917, 18, 19. Second World War was in 39, well, we didn't get it until 41, but 41 to 45. And then Korea, and then Vietnam, and then Afghanistan. Oh, throw a grenade in there too. Go rescue a bunch of women in their bikinis. And then uh, from a medical school. Can you understand that? What the heck is that all about? Send the Marines. And then Afghanistan, Iraq, and all this other nonsense. And you know what? Give it 20 years, what are we going to be doing probably? Fighting something somewhere. Somebody will do something. But we'll have to step in and say, no. You can't do it that way. Well, we do do it that way because America feels responsible to the rest of the world. Now, the rest of the world doesn't feel that way. But we do. So we sacrifice our young men, you guys, to go into the service to fight uh, and right a wrong as somebody else's perpetrator. And that is a lot of what the prophet does. He's given a job by God, looks at you and says, Jeremy or Zachary, I need you two to go in and preach this word to these guys. Tell them they're screwing up. Tell them I'm really upset about it. 
and tell them, boy, there's a calamity coming, you ain't got it. You haven't got a clue how bad it's going to be, but it will be total destruction. Tell them that. And you guys do that. Well, how good a friend are you going to be to anybody? You're not. They're going to want to get rid of you because you're bringing bad news. You're telling us what's going to happen. We're telling you we don't want to hear it. Okay, if you don't want to hear it, does that change the situation? Does that change the situation? Now listen to me. 90% of Americans are saying, hey, live in Jesus, love Jesus, believe in Jesus. And 90% of America is saying what? We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it in our schools. We don't want to hear it in our government. We don't want to hear it or see it on plaques or walls or posters. But without it, what is your alternative? God says, I will repay you according to your way. Well, the fact of the matter is, if you read the Revelation, um, if you read the Revelation, excuse me, I got something bothering my eyeball here. Okay. If you read the Revelation, some real bad stuff's going down. It's going to be every bit as bad as when God destroyed his own people in his own land. Remember, God's not destroying enemies here. He's destroying the children he chose and blessed because they turned away from him. It's going to be every bit as bad as this, but it's going to be on a global scale. Imagine that. If you took this kind of horrible disaster, and it was, it was, ooh, there's books that you can read and just turn your stomach. What was going on in those final days before the invasion? Uh, people eating their own children, stuff like this. Killing one another just to get, you know, to roast to their leg or their hips. And disease everywhere. Everybody was sick. Everybody, the, the, it was terrible. Fear, you couldn't sleep. They were exhausted. It was just a horrible situation. And every bit of what happened here is but a million of what's going to happen here, according to the Revelation. The Revelation is very specific about all the destruction and everything that happens. In fact, uh, the first event, when God breaks the first seal on the seven seals, is the dark star hits the earth and a third of the earth is destroyed, just like that. Uh, anybody see that movie Armageddon with Bruce Willis in it? Yeah. Well, that's how the, that's how the apocalypse begins. That's how, that we call it Armageddon, as the global killer. That's what the Bible calls it. And they named that movie Armageddon because in the movie when they see how big that asteroid is, the dark star, uh, roughly the size of Texas, and it's moving at 23,000 miles an hour straight at the earth, it's going to hit that earth, it's going to destroy everything. Now it doesn't matter where you live because eventually going to destroy everything, just like it did a billion years ago when suddenly, overnight, all the dinosaurs disappeared around the world. That's just a little rock in, 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 in space where God's going, watch this. <laughs> See what I'm saying? Well, we'll just do it our own way. We're strong enough. We're smart enough. We have the technology. Well, I don't think Bruce Willis is going when this one starts coming. When God breaks that first seal and that dark star's on its way, I don't think Bruce Willis and his boys are going to land on it and drill a hole and blow it up and it's going to miss us. I think God's aim is a little bit better than that. Kind of like when he threw the ice cube at the Titanic, remember? We'll build a ship that God himself couldn't even sink. Here, hold my Coke. He took an ice cube out. And... 
Well, I put an end to that, right? No. Then the Germans built a Zeppelin that even God himself couldn't bring down. <laughs> Hold my other Coke. <laughs> One lightning bolt. <laughs> oh, the humanity, the humanity. You remember that broadcast? Yes. That's how easy it is. And people don't, still don't want to hear it. But we're much smarter than those <laughs> cavemen back in the days of, you know, the disaster. Are we? I don't want you putting Jesus or saying anything about Jesus in my schools. I don't want you saying anything about it in government. I want you to take down that plaque. Get rid of that statue. I don't want anything. I don't want to hear it. You know, you're okay if you want to worship Satan and get into all kinds of weird rituals. You're okay if you want to, you know, worship something else like crystals. You know, in California, they sell jeans with crystals right in the crotch so you can, you know, feel the power all day. <laughs> They're expensive, like $200 a pair. And I sat there and I looked, you got a rock in your underwear. <laughs> that can't be good. But you can feel the power. Well, you're going to feel something. I don't know if it's power. But with that crystal down there, see, that'll save you no matter what. Really. I think it's just another weight that'll help you sink faster if you fall in the water. That's mentality. That's mankind thinking, oh, we'll do it ourselves. And a prophet shows up to say, you guys are making a huge mistake here, man. The world is not going to be receptive to your message. The world is not going to be, oh, gee, you're a preacher. Come on in. Quite the contrary. Jesus made it quite plain. You know what? The world hates me. And they hate me now when I'm here. They're going to hate everybody who believes in me even more. When they persecute you, stay strong. When they say all ugly things against you, stay strong. When they revile you and throw you out of their churches, and when they even drag you to crosses to crucify you, don't give in. Because truly, I'm telling you, there's something much grander than you can even imagine. If you do, what's the alternative? And today we're doing the very same thing in the United States of America. Every day. Our news channels are all corrupted. They're all, you know, preaching and all this other nonsense. But talk about Jesus? No. That's not allowed. You see what I'm saying? But we're much smarter than those old cavemen back in those days. See, we're, we would never do something like that. We would never be that stupid. Well, they saw, thought the same thing right up until God brought the army up to the walls of the city and said, you're done. You ever read the book of uh, Habakkuk? I love that book. Habakkuk is wonderful. Yeah. And Habakkuk said, God, this city is nothing but horrible. Why don't you do something? What's wrong with you? And what did God tell him? You remember what he said? Climb up to the pinnacle, the, the highest point on the temple, and look at down over the walls and tell me what you see. Well, he saw 188,000 soldiers completely surrounding the city in what was one of the largest armies in that day and age throughout history. And their desire was to destroy and kill everybody in the city. That's what God is showing Ezekiel. What would it take to get God that angry that none will survive except the little tiny children that can be sold as slaves? What can make God that angry? Well, I'll tell you what. Jesus said He can forgive any sin except what? The blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that. The blaspheming of the Holy Spirit means you no longer take God seriously. You blow Him off. 
The, first, the last thing you want to say when you stand before God and He says, well, we're going to have to decide what to do with you. The last thing you want to say is, oh, whatever. It's because we said whatever down here that got us in trouble in the first place. See, God doesn't want to be your friend. God doesn't want to be a class that you learn about in. God wants to be a partner in your life. Every mid, as much as Tim is your partner, and you are Kugaracha's partner. He wants a strong day-to-day, everyday, committed, faithful, reliant relationship. Every bit as close, strong, and intimate as a husband and a wife. That's why Jesus, throughout the entire New Testament, refers to the church as the bride and himself as the bridegroom. You don't want to be your friend. God does not want to be your friend. Never did. He wants to be your life partner. And that means for life. Because he hates divorce, said that in Malachi. I hate divorce. Anybody turns away from me, blows me off. So, question. In this day and age of enlightenment and modernity, what is it, 2019? Almost 2019 years since our Savior walked the earth. Where are we? Oh, well, if we had a Savior amongst us, we wouldn't be so stupid. We are that stupid. You know what? You probably have friends that are part of the stupid. And they probably teach you and tell you and try and influence you to be as stupid as them. And Jesus whispers, stay strong, son of man. Stay strong. Fail me now. Stay strong. You and I together. It's the only way to get through this calamity because this calamity is happening all around this earth. Jesus made it quite plain. This earth, everything in it, is passing away. You know, we look at things like the Grand Canyon. You ever seen the Grand Canyon? I think Evelyn's out there now, isn't she? She's in Maine. Yeah, she texted me last night. She's in Vegas. She won eight grand on a casino machine and Chuck took it and went and bought a hooker. And <laughs> I texted her back and said, what are you doing in that nasty city? <laughs> we had a little fun with it last night. Anyway, we look at the Grand Canyon and what do we think? Anybody ever seen it here? Yeah. Have you? Big hole in the ground. Giant hole. Pretty impressive when you see it. You know, that wasn't always there. You know what caused it? Colorado River. Year after year after year. The water winding through, winding through, and just wore it away. Wore it away. Wore it away. Through ice ages, through global warms, through everything. Over the billions of years, wore it away. So now we stand and we go, wow, look at that giant crack in the earth. Once it was all fertile farmland. <laughs> that was great. That's the world us. And as impressive as a landmark it is now, Grand Canyon is really no longer good for anything, is it? Except for just getting on the back of a donkey and riding down and looking at it. Other than that, really not a very good piece of real estate. If I were going to build a house, I probably wouldn't build it there. Because the next rain, that river rises and floods to destroy your house. There's no firm foundation under it. Mighty impressive, but let's face it, what it is, it's a worn out old giant hole in the ground. You know why the Appalachian Mountains are so much smaller than the Rocky Mountains? At one time, they were as 
high as the Rocky Mountains, even, even higher, it's believed. But you know what? They were formed about a billion years before the Rocky Mountains. Look at those billion years. You know what happens to these big, giant, huge mountains? Because when you stand at a mountain, you go, wow. Down, 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 down. The highest peak now, I think, in the Appalachian Mountains is Mount Mitchell, isn't it? It's about 6,000 feet high. What's that? That a little over a mile. Highest peak out in the Rockies, isn't that McKinley or Pikes Peak, whatever? Yeah, about 15, 16,000. Everest, 34,000. That's the highest peak in the world. Some of the mountains under the sea are three times the size of Everest. But we can't see those. But you know what? Even now, Everest is wearing down. It's losing about two inches a year. Who would have thought that? Two inches a year of the hardest, biggest, tallest, mountain on the planet. Well, how many billions a year? One or two before it's... It's a Mount Mitchell. It's passing away, gentlemen. It's like God said. The calamity is already happening and the fact that the earth and everything therein is passing away. You guys are no longer babies anymore, are you? You're adults almost. Or at least young adults. Uh, are either one of you 21 yet? Okay, well, in a couple of years. <clears throat> Baby days are over. Getting off the hook, you're over. Now if you do something wrong, what happens? The dragon, the dragon lady's all over. <laughs> you're held responsible, right? As years go by and you move out, then you'll say, now I'm responsible for myself again. ta -da. Are you really? I'll agree that you're still as responsible for what you do as you were under the tutelage of your mother and father. But now that you have license out here, whether to decide to, decide to maintain that good behavior or go off in your own ways, you're still going to be held accountable either way. Think about it. And if we uh, can understand that so easily in this physical life, can we not understand it in the spiritual life? When you were a baby, Jesus said, the babies are mine, don't mess with them. But when you guys became adults physically, you also became adults spiritually. And yet the day is coming where you can tell Dad, I'm not going to church anymore. I'm not listening to Chandler's stupid stories anymore. You can do that. You will have that right. Dad won't like it. The dragon lady's going to call you bad names in some language you'll never understand. But the fact of the matter is, you have that right, but are you making the best decision? Because through it all, the calamity is happening. You're getting older, the earth is getting older. Eventually, it will all come to a head. And based on what you did all this way through, it's going to determine the outcome. See, that's a lifelong challenge. That's what Jesus says when he says, I don't want to be your friend. I don't need uh, you know, a couple of good buddies. I need dedicated disciples, servants that will run the whole race. Stay in there for the long haul, running faithfully, running strongly until it's over. The scripture is quite plain. How long must I praise the Lord? Well, as long as there's breath in your body. That's what the scripture says in Psalms. As long as there's breath in your body, you have the opportunity to either live in or reject That's a whole life, isn't it? As long as there's breath in my body. That's a whole life. Another psalm says, day to day pours forth God's speech. Night to night, 
comes his, his, his preaching, his wisdom, his liturgy. And though you may not hear a voice, believe me, it's still coming. And it's still there. Right up until the day your last breath leaves you. And that decision will be made then. The Lord says it's given to every man to die but once upon which he has an appointment. That he will keep upon which God will render his decision. That's a promise. Well, gentlemen, when's it okay to blow off God and say, I'm not going to do this? Well, you have that decision every day. When is it a good decision? Never. Why? Well, because if there is a God, if there is a heaven or hell, and if there is the end of the world, you live a good life and you'll be grand. But if you go God off and if there is all that stuff and you live a, you know, the like best life you can and then you die, you're in a lot of trouble. Just like these people were in a lot of trouble. And come back and yell to God saying, Why don't you do something? I'm up on the top of the temple and look out over the walls of the city and tell me what you I don't know, but if 180,000 armed savages surrounded my house, I would be concerned about that. Even an AR-15 is not going to help you. Not for long. Well, there's armed savages that surround us every day. You know what we call it? age, wear and tear. You don't believe me now? You guys are young and strong. And you jump out of bed, you grab your baseball stuff, you go out, get the sand lot, and play ball all day long with nothing fixes. Me, I wake up in the morning, it takes me two, about an hour and a half to get out of bed. And everything hurts, and everything aches. And I get in the shower for like a week, turn on the nozzles, Girl says, why do you take our shower? He says, you can get cleaner in less time than that. I said, it's not about getting clean. I just need this hot water to run over this old beat up body because I've run it pretty hard for 64 years. And you know what? It's just worn out. And it takes all that. And once I get out of there, oh, I'm good to go for the day until we wake up tomorrow and we do it all over. I'm reminded on a daily basis that this earth and everything that is passing away, including me. I'm going in the advices of Joshua. There's plenty of other things you could be doing. Uh oh, there's plenty of other things you could be doing, I know. But as for me and my house, we will serve. Good call. Good call on Joshua's part. Okay, guys, that's chapter 7. God's trying to set Ezekiel up so he'll know what and what happened, but why he needs to preach this message to this new generation so that they don't get lost again. Remember, this is the third generation lost. An entire generation. They were all wiped out in Noah's flood. They were all wiped out in the Egyptian thing in the wilderness. And now they're all wiped out again for crying out loud. Why can't these people learn? But we're here in 2019. We're not as stupid as they are. 